Uh, thanks very much, Rachel, and thank you, Caroline, for the invitation to uh, speak here today. Um, what I'm going to speak about is this. I'm, I wonder, is it possible for us to develop mental health interventions for children that are technology-based and make them available for free or at very low cost? Um, I believe it is, and I believe it's important that we do so. And I hope by the end of this talk that that's a, share, a view that you might come to, to share as well. If you know about therapy or you're familiar with the ideas of therapy, the idea of adding technology to therapy might seem like a strange one. You might think, surely therapy is this very personal, distinctly emotional, very human activity that we engage in. And you're right, it is that. But technology is also something that's distinctly human. This is one of the oldest objects in the British Museum. It's a 1.2 million year old stone hand axe. Our ancestors used this technology to shape their world, to survive it. Um, it literally, in its time, was the cutting edge of human technology. It allowed our ancestors to do things that were impossible for previous creatures to do before them. So technology and the history of technology is very much a part of human history. And as Matt Ridley points out, human history is one where we've continued to build uh, hand tools from the stone hand axe to the mouse on your computer or the smartphone that's hopefully on silent in your pocket. Projects like ours which seek to take technology and integrate them with therapy are simply trying to integrate two human capacities. Our capacity for an emotional relationship, a personal emotional relationship with our world and our capacity for a technological relationship with our world. Our project is an attempt to adapt technology to make cognitive behaviour therapy, or CBT, available for children. Um, the people who are involved in that are myself, Dr David Coyle, who's a computer scientist, and Dr Nicola McGlade, who's another clinical psychologist. If you experience any of the major mental health difficulties or emotional problems of adulthood, the scientific evidence is really clear. You'll be better off if you receive CBT. So if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you experience PTSD, uh, if you experience psychosis, CBT works really well, and there's a very clear evidence base for that. And CBT is based on a very simple idea, and it's not going to be a surprise to anybody. Um, I'm quite an introverted person, so for me, a good situation is one where a day might go something like this, where there's a relationship between my thinking, my feeling, and my behaviour that's positive. Uh, so I might be in my office over in the Newman building, and I might be locked away reading some books that I'm quite enjoying. And if it's a Friday, I might be thinking, yippee, it's the weekend, no more work for me after today. I'm going to feel great happiness and joy. And if you see me leave UCD, I'll probably do it with a hop, skip and a jump. So there's a positive relationship between my thinking, my feeling uh, and my behaviour. Other days in work for me are a little bit more challenging. So a situation might be where I have to give a TEDx talk to a bunch of brainy people who are interested in hearing some ideas we're sharing. And I'm standing here in front of you thinking, oh, I'm boring these people with my rubbish talk and I'm forgetting all my lines. And I feel great anxiety as a consequence. And then I'm going to, unfortunately for you, stumble and stutter and deliver the rest of this talk very poorly. When we experience mental health difficulty, our thinking, feeling and behaviour is more of this quality. We are locked in this negative automatic thinking, problematic feelings, negative behaviour as a consequence. And CBT, very simply, helps a person become aware of that. So we learn to notice our thinking, its related feeling, and the behaviours that we engage in related to that. And with the help of a therapist, we use that to build up a map of self-understanding, which has this thinking, feeling, behaviour relationship at the top. And at its very root, we come to look for a core idea, or central organising scheme, or, or what the CBT therapists call a core belief that fuels uh, much of our mental life. So it directs the kind of things that we pay attention to. Um, it determines what kind of things we remember. Do we just remember the bad stuff? Um, it interprets neutral or ambiguous events. So if something is ambiguous, will I interpret it badly if I'm depressed? Um, it shapes the attitudes and beliefs that we hold. So in cognitive therapy, uh, an adult builds up this map of self-understanding and they use their understanding of this map to lead to their own recovery, to change their thinking, to change their feeling, to change their behaviour. The problem with using cognitive therapy with children, that this is a lot of what developmental psychologists would call metacognition. It's thinking about your thinking. It's thinking about how your thinking affects your feelings. Thinking about how your thinking affects your behaviour. Thinking about if you think things differently, will you feel differently? And thinking about if you have one great big super taught or core belief which is fueling the entire system. If you're 20, 30, 50, 90, that's a challenging enough thing to do. But that's particularly difficult to do if you're 10. 
So this is the problem with cognitive therapy. It is metacognitive uh, in many aspects of what happens in cognitive therapy. So our solution to that is to try, try and develop uh, a computer game for children to play in session uh, with a mental health professional, and it's called Pesky Nats. It's a six-session computer game that children play with a therapist, and we put four very simple ingredients into it. It's designed for children who are nine years in, or older and for children who are experiencing anxiety or low mood. The four ingredients that go into it are that we use an unfolding concrete metaphor that explains many of the core ideas of CBT to children. So we explain to a child in playing the game that having a negative automatic thought, well that's not unlike being stung by a fly or a little gnat. You might notice it at the time, but actually it can have an effect on you. So as a child plays the game, they learn how to monitor their thinking by setting a gnat trap. They learn how to restructure their thinking by swatting gnats. And they learn to discover what their core belief is by hunting gnats back to their hive. So this metaphor unfolds during the course uh, of the game. We also know from developmental psychology that children's thinking is at its most sophisticated when it's embedded in a social context. So children think best when they're thinking about their social world, their family, their friends, their relationships, stories. Um, so a computer game allows you a wonderful opportunity to present a child with a social story in order to learn CBT type skills. So in the game, the child is represented by a character who visits an island and on that island they meet a world famous explorer called David Nattenborough. And he thinks gnats are so extraordinary that he set up the world's first gnat lab in order for you to work with him and his assistants in order to learn how to set a gnat trap, how to swat a gnat and how to hunt a gnat back to its hive. The third ingredient that we've put into it is that we also know from developmental psychology that children's thinking is assisted when it has a scaffolding. And that scaffolding can be an adult to help you think things true. So this isn't an online game, it isn't something for children to take away and work on by themselves. Children play the game side by side with a mental health professional who understands CBT ideas. The characters in the game share ideas and illustrate ideas with the child. They ask the child, how does that apply to you? And the child figures that out by talking it through with a therapist sitting beside them, and then they give their answers to the character in the game. So the child is supported in applying these ideas to their lives uh, in that way. And the fourth very simple ingredient that we put into the game is that it is a computer game. It's this marvellous, destigmatizing, ordinary, everyday tool that children enjoy. And there's something very nice about being able to manage the difficulties that, experience, that you experience with the things that you're familiar with and with the things that you enjoy uh, as well. So, for example, these are some screenshots from the game. The bottom left-hand uh, corner picture there, for example, is that in the game children learn that there are different types of negative automatic uh, thinking. In the game, there are different species of gnat. So this is our gnat gallery, and the child interacts with those and learns about different types of negative uh, automatic thinking. We thought it was a good idea, but what do therapists think? To date, we've trained for free, not 141 mental health professionals from three different countries. Most of them come from Ireland, uh, many come from the USA, some come from the UK as well. And so as part of the training, we ask those therapists to evaluate what they think of the game. Their backgrounds are varied. Some are clinical psychologists like myself, some are other types of psychologists, some are child and adolescent psychiatrists, psychotherapists, social workers. 96% uh, of mental health professionals from three different countries rate pesky gnats as above average or excellent in terms of being a clinical tool that they can use with children. So the initial response of clinicians to the game itself is very positive. The research evidence is very clear. We know that one of the things that, make ter that makes therapy work isn't the techniques that your therapist uses, but the quality of the therapeutic relationship that a therapist builds with a client. So in essence, all we're trying to do is to drop in a piece of technology and a hard copy manual that supports the child's learning between sessions into a high quality therapeutic uh, relationship. So in essence, that's all we're, we're, we're simply trying to do. So in order to determine have we have we achieved that aim, one of the things that we're interested in doing is measuring the quality of therapeutic relationship that people experience, whether they play the game or they engage in treatment as usual. So this is some uh, data from a pilot study that we've conducted in the HSE in Galway. We're very grateful to Claire Gormley and Alan Delahunty and their colleagues in the HSE in Galway who've allowed us to, uh, to do this study. And what's happened here is that we've taken 29 children attending mental health services uh, in Galway, and 16 of those children have played pesky nats with the therapists, 
and 13 have engaged in treatment as usual. So they've done the kind of things that the therapists would usually do. Uh, this is a measure of the quality of the therapeutic relationship that was created in those two <coughs> conditions. Uh, the blue line is pesky nuts and the green line is treatment as usual. Higher scores represent higher quality therapeutic relationship. These two lines are statistically equivalent. And what they're really telling us is that pesky nuts creates a very high quality therapeutic relationship. You don't in any way demean or take away from the quality of the therapeutic relationship that you create in playing a game like this uh, in therapy. So that seems to be good news. The next question that we wanted to know is what happens to the status of children with mental health from playing the game in a study like this? So again, this is the same study, 16 children who are represented by the blue line who've played pesky nuts and 13 children who attended uh, uh, treatment as usual. Their presenting problem are internalising difficulties, so that's anxiety and low mood. Uh, higher scores here are representative, are representative of problems. So you can see both groups are in the clinical range for internalising difficulties pre-intervention. The blue line you see improvement from from, uh, from clinical to just on the cusp of normal and the green line from clinical to clinical. Again, both lines are statistically equivalent in terms of recovery, so it shows good quality improvement uh, can be achieved by playing a game like this over six sessions, which is a very brief intervention uh, in, a, in a mental health context. So these are ratings of par by parents of their children's behaviour, which are on a standardised measure of children's symptomatology. So parents are rating improvement uh, in, the, in their children. These are the children's own ratings. This is a child outcome rating scale. So this is session by session children are asked, did you find today's session helpful in terms of how you're doing, how you're doing in relation to school, how you're doing in relation to your family, or how your life is going in general? This time, higher scores are reflective of better outcome. Uh, there is a statistical significant difference between these two uh, lines. The children playing pesky and are saying, actually, I found that more helpful. Uh, I feel better off, I'm doing better at school, I'm doing better in my family. My life generally is going better. And these are some of the comments that children make from playing the game. Um, about finding out my core belief and now I don't worry as much. Um, I can think more positively and I'm better armed to deal with my, my depression. I feel I'm getting better. So it seems that children are saying, yes, that was a positive experience for me. It's rated by the parents as showing improvement and children uh, themselves. So can programmes like this take place simply in mental health clinics, or do they have an application broader than that? And we think they do. This is pilot data from a different study that we've engaged in. This is this uh, uh, with NEPS, which is the National Educational Psychology Service. So these are school psychologists on the north side of Dublin, and we're very grateful to Saif Coyle and her team there for, for this study. These are parent and child ratings of children's symptoms on internalising difficulties. Again, this is a school psychologist playing the game in a school over the course of six different uh, meetings with a young person. And again, you can see children, as rated by themselves and their parents, are showing improvement from clinical problems to, uh, to normal functioning again from playing the game. So the game seems to work well, not just in mental health settings, but also in, in school settings as well. We have loads and loads of ideas based on our experience of building this game, researching it to date uh, for the future. All of our work to date has been unfunded, so we've done these things without any direct uh, funding to support us. But notwithstanding that, we're still optimistic about the future, where we hope we will get the opportunity to build many different games into the future. Different aged children, slightly different versions of the game depending on the child's presenting difficulty. We think there's loads of, uh, of opportunity for that. We also want to continue to embrace technology into therapy. So these are some screenshots from a prototype app that we were trying to build, which would replace the child's hard copy manual that they use to remind them of tasks uh, in between sessions. We think this kind of technology just makes engaging in a therapeutic pro process like this just much more appealing and interesting and exciting uh, for a child. But our real vision of the future is this one. We want our website to be a digital training hub. So if you're a mental health professional working anywhere in Ireland, anywhere in the UK, North America, Australia, you can sit at your desk. You can register uh, your qualifications with us. And at your desk, you can complete our training online. And when you've done that, then that you can download the game and you can use it with your clients. The beauty of technology isn't just its capacity to uh, make these materials available to children, but it's the capacity for us to make the materials themselves available to mental health professionals around the world at very low cost. So the question is, how generous should we be with this kind of technology? We believe that technology is a part of humanity's cultural heritage, and that good mental health is a part of every child's birthright. So for us, it's not just a good idea to share ideas, but also to share the technology that shares those ideas with children. So that's it. Thank you very much.